Want more positivity in your life? Subscribe, turn on notifications, follow us, and you know, all that techie stuff. We'd love to hear from you. Comment, share, or give us a thumbs up. We are grateful to have you hanging out with us at Matt Logan Speaks. Welcome back, everybody, to part two of the conversation with Nels Pearson. If you're just tuning into part two, hopefully you go and check out part one in the conversation. It's an incredible conversation. I learned a lot, as I always do, from the wise Nels Pearson III. Check it out, part two. And those are, I, I, again, sorry. those are all today things. Go ahead, things. the five no, billion. <laughs> no, those are all today things, and those are all legitimate. The five billion is money that gets spent in the next two years. And because those five billion dollars won't be there, how many people won't get the services they need in the that future. will save their lives? Yes. How many people will die because we have this budget shortfall? Yeah. It isn't about taking money out of out of the, you know, it's just it's not magic money that just appears. It's money that we have budgeted every every biennium. And when you take five billion dollars out of it because you've shut down our economy essentially, those five billion dollars are going towards all kinds of services yeah, throughout our state. And let's and just call them social programs. To- well, and that's what people. Well, you 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 want to take the social health and programs. human services exactly. is a big part of our budget. Our education system is a big part of our budget. Um, you know, where do you want to make those cuts in the next biennium? Um, when we signed into law that gave the governor his emergency powers, that gave him the ability to spend our reserves. Yeah. So right now, we still have a balanced budget. But it took us 10 years to save up the $2.7 billion yeah. that the governor was then authorized to spend to get us through this biennium. That's why we're not really feeling any impacts right now in in our social services or health and human services or education. We're not feeling that impact yet. But the reserves are gone. Yeah. That was it. The 10 years it took us to do everything we can to kind of, you know, there were all kinds of shifts and gimmicks that were going on during the last time that we had a budget shortfall. And we filled in all those pots of money and we got our reserves healthy. And that's what gives us a double A bond rating in the state of Minnesota. All these good things, all positive things. And seven months later, uh, we're looking we're looking at a very serious budgeting forecast. Um, and I, again, the, the impacts... It, are, today, that, are the today are impacts, today impacts you're impacts. talking about? Yep, that's what I'm talking about. And they're about, also going to be in the next biennium when we don't have it, those dollars. Exactly. And when they're a today problem and you have the additional money issues that we're talking about, that you don't have the money to spend on the different social services for our state of Minnesota, that now today's problems get catapulted and increase in volume significantly. Certainly. And no. that's... The governor needs to answer some questions. It gets me really frustrated. I, and that's where, that's where I, to me, if someone in any position of leadership, and especially elected leadership, if you can't answer questions, I'm done with you. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm seriously done with you. That is completely a power trip to me. Mm-hmm. If you can't answer questions. Right. So, you know, the, the kind of the third leg of the stool a lot yeah. of times is the media. And, you know, they've been asking some tough questions, but I just not really? enough. <laughs> not enough, in my opinion. Well, I can tell you a couple of reporters that, sure. that, are, that are certainly going after the administration. But, but uh, the availability and the, the access uh, is, is certainly in – we would like to see more of that and, and uh, as a – as a state rep, like I say, I would like to see more access because, you know, maybe some of the things that are doing would make more sense if I had more information. But Absolutely. until I have more information, I, I still can't understand. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, approaching 2,000 deaths now in the state of Minnesota. Right. And uh, of those, 1,400 of those deaths occurred in long-term care facilities yes. or, or nursing homes. and Which, by the way, the governor put people in those nursing homes and that's the question like 
what made us think that that was the best place to put people, especially early on, yep. um, you know, where the nursing homes maybe didn't have all the resources or protocols in place. And again, they take great care of people. These are people doing, absolutely, in my opinion, God's work and, yep. and not to uh, insert uh, religion into the thing, but the, these are salt of the earth people, wonderful people that are taking care of our most vulnerable and, For and sure. aged. And, um, and, and, and through no that, fault of their own exactly. in most situations, I, I I would acknowledge they're just trying to do everything they can. But when someone was released from the hospital and then brought into a long-term care facility where our most vulnerable population exactly. existed, and we knew that back then. Yes. Ex- explain to me or show me the justifications for yes. that so I, I can stop saying that publicly because if there is a justification, great. If there's not... Admit you made a mistake, yeah. but it's still policy. It's still going on. Yep. Um, and last spring, especially, I, I, I just was asking, why are we sending people who, again, the presumption is they're being released from the hospital because they're not sick. They don't need treatment, but they need to allow this to run its course. Yep. The 14 days that we all talk about it, so that becomes dormant and not you're not contagious mm-hmm. any longer. And so. And those things make sense. Right. Why weren't, Absolutely. But why weren't we sending those folks to the abandoned college campuses that were all over the state of Minnesota where they had cafeteria, exactly. they had dormitories, mm-hmm. they had the ability to do this. Um, a good friend of mine from Byron uh, was actually on one of the cruise ships early on when an outbreak happened on their cruise ship. Yeah. And they had to be quarantined. Well, they got sent to a military base out in California and they had dormitories and they were given three square meals a day and she's like i had all the books i wanted to read on my apps and yeah she was fine she was happy you know retired so it wasn't sure. wasn't a big uh it was more of an adventure she you know took it in stride but you know we 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 sent people to the nursing homes and long-term care facilities and in you, amongst all kinds of other people you just had that to doesn't wonder make any sense but, yeah um since we're on that topic, the Minnesota Department of Health also, they just came out and, and the governor's office, I think, was tied to that. Um, they're not going to report uh, the hospitalizations in the ICUs yeah. any longer. Um, I'm still trying to soak that in. I read that last night. Yeah. Um, and I, or no, the night before last, I think. And um, wow. Why in the world would you not? So a, that that's the pulse right there. I, again, you're putting me in the position no, right. to defend I, it, but I, it, but yeah. I will a little bit more background because again, yeah. the the numbers or the justifications that they've given anyway, you know, a little bit of those numbers weren't particularly helpful because those were Minnesota citizens in Minnesota ICU beds only, and that's what that number was really reporting. What they we're worried about that misinforming the public on is how many ICU beds with COVID patients existed in Minnesota. And believe it or not, there are people from out of the state of Minnesota that ended up having to be admitted uh, into Minnesota hospitals and they didn't count in those numbers. Um, My understanding is that they're going to provide some additional statistics that we haven't seen before. And the really good news is they're actually going, they've been gathering all of the data the entire time. And we're going to be able to track some of those numbers for the total number of ICU beds that are being used and, and, um, and it won't just be a daily. It won't be just today's numbers moving forward. It's going to give us the ability to track where we've been and whether or not we're improving. But the ICU bed thing is, I think it's a huge issue. Um, it, it's one of those things. Again, when we started this process, it was so that our ICU system wouldn't be overwhelmed. Right. I, I mentioned that earlier in our interview. Obviously, that's what we were seeing in other parts of the world. And, you know, hospitals don't want to have ICU beds sitting empty necessarily either. They want to be doing patient care, mm-hmm. um, whether that's someone coming out of a surgery. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to have thousands of empty ICU beds. We don't build hospitals beyond the capacity of what we need. That 
we lose money and we lose efficiency and that would increase the cost of all of our health care if we were doing that. So and you know, we don't want to overwhelm care side. Yeah, right. We yeah. don't want to overwhelm the system, private. but we yeah. also don't want to be paying so much money for a system that is inefficient either. So, you know, that that balance is so important. And when we see those numbers, and those numbers have been much lower than what we were told we wanted to keep those much number <laughs> at. And again, the modeling that projected why we did the things that we did, actually all of those projections assumed we would do the things that we did. And, sure. and then the actual model outcomes, even though we did what those models said we were going to do, mm -hmm. the you know, again, the numbers are dramatically lower. I mean, in the peak of it all, in the middle of July, we were supposed to be having 1,500 deaths per day. Day, yes. Per day. Yeah. And that was that was the anticipated and, and, peak of all of this. Yeah. And now, obviously, we are sitting at, uh, again, 1,900 uh, tragic deaths in the state of Minnesota. And, and they, again, those are, those are terrible things, and it's uh, awful consequences of, of this terrible disease. Um, but, I, but again... It's nowhere near what the modeling and the projections were at. And again, it, it goes kind of to the ICU being able to track and know yeah. who's who's where and when. And we've been watching those numbers really closely, trying to figure out why why you can say we didn't flatten the curve, because it seems likely we flattened the curve, which was why we went into this shutdown to begin with from your perspective and where you sit and what you've looked at masks um do you want to weigh in on that i mean i wish there were true unbiased information that we could trust out there there um, there, there was <laughs> well and, and i've said this before and let me let me bring you down this path um as you know i used to build furniture yeah and so um, what I had to do was the material safety data sheets. So any kind of chemical that we had and right. any, any of that. So I dealt with masks. Um, so there's respirator masks that you can do whatever you want to right. do, paint cars right. and everything, and yep. it does not affect you. You don't smell anything. You, you fit them right. You don't smell anything. You're good. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the N95 masks that are going to block out the different particles and microns right. and all this kind of stuff. So they had all kinds of science on that for many, many years and solid science. And so this virus is, um, you know, whatever it was, 0 0.0125 microns or whatever. Yep, yep. And an N95 mask is is going to block out maybe 20% of that, mm -hmm. an N95 mask. I mean, the, and the, we're not using N95 masks. And we're not using <laughs> N95 masks. So there used to be the science yeah. there is what I'm saying. Yep. And they had that tracked, and it used to be legitimate and, and all those things. And now... Um, face coverings. You can't even call them masks, you know, uh, and that's okay. But well, it's, I, it's actually not okay because the, but, the one study I had read had, was basically saying one of these kind of nylon -y type things actually disperses the part particulates it even breaks it more. Up. It, it breaks them up and more. And so it or makes some. it easier yeah. for it to travel yeah. further yep. and in more particles. So, I mean, but, we have some scary things that we're misinforming the public on. Yes, I correct. So, but when you look at what has been happening, the numbers aren't changing. We've been wearing face coverings, masks for a long time, right. and the numbers aren't changing. Now, I travel all over the country. Yeah. South Dakota, if you're wearing a mask, they're looking at you funny. Well, their numbers are high in South Dakota yeah. per, per million and. You know, we got to be careful with some of this. I, I don't know. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is you, you know, their hospitalizations and their deaths per capita yeah. are, are just not there. Right. And um, some of these other uh, states and, and things like that that don't have the mass policy or are as hardcore with it anyway um, are sh are not showing any different numbers than what yeah. we are as a state of Minnesota. Now let me say this: If you're getting on an airplane and you're, if you're at a hotel and if you're at some of these other larger public places, they won't let you on an airplane or in an airport right. without a face covering. They won't let you in the hotel without, you know, all those things. But yet the uh, so the masks either are or aren't working, right? And so if they are working, why can't we do things? And if they aren't working, or if the, if they also are working, how come the numbers are 
not changing. Yeah, one of the one of the and so what's wrong and what's not? Yeah, how, how come that? If masks work, why did we release people out of prisons? You know, that was the, why didn't we just give them masks? You know, those those types of things are all real. I think. Um, yeah, so there's you, you talk about think, hypocrisy before. Well, and, 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 but I think even more important even is, is the freedom to make some of these choices, and and, and I think that's what what's really being lost in in um in our current state of our state. Uh, in a lot of ways, if if the public were informed, they would do everything they felt necessary to keep themselves and others safe. And if they were well informed and it was information they could trust. Right. Like like the masks, I look at this mask stuff that they're trying to talk about and and I'm like for 20 years that I was in the furniture business, yeah. You just threw all of that science out the window. All right. of it, every right. single bit of it. And and it it became political. Yeah. I believe that wholeheartedly. Sure. Um yeah. You don't have to agree or disagree, but well, with, for one thing, my personal I haven't, experience, I haven't been ha- allowed to have the hearings to have those questions, point. and and that's for me. I'm given about as much knowledge as anyone else in the general public, and of course, it's an election year, so I am focused on some other things too. And for because sure. I can't actually vote or make a change on this issue, it isn't something I'll acknowledge that I've fully investigated. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what what I've kind of felt for a long time is if having masks gave us the right to open everything up and go full steam ahead then i was okay with it you know i mean it it seemed like a small price to pay and i'll acknowledge to my freedom freedom loving americans that that's not what they want to hear necessarily um but again more importantly is getting our economy going getting people to feel safe when they're out and about and and interacting um you know s- some of the science is is simply we think we're safer because we have the masks so we are standing closer to each other than we probably would if we weren't wearing the masks and so now all of a sudden that, that has a negative consequence of wearing the mask now i think i can be closer to someone than maybe i should be let me let me say it like this you used safe um feeling safe that's what right but uh, correct sorry but what what i want to say is um why don't we build strong why why is why is it about safe why don't we build strong See what when I early on in in this I started looking at it in in doing research. Okay, vitamin D is a huge, 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 huge factor in the people who are dying. Mm-hmm. Huge, eighty some odd percent of the people who have died from COVID, no matter what age they are, are vitamin D deficient. Eighty some odd percent. That's not a coincidence. You have zinc as a big factor as well. Zinc deficiencies, people who are dying, is also a high percentage um, since we're talking about this specifically. So the max, we need to we need to do things. Car seats, they've come a long way. It's right. great. I mean, that keeps people safe, right? But we built it strong. It was about strength first. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about, you, you know what I'm saying? So why aren't we trying to build each other strong? I think you started running this spring or something like that. I, I did I, I do don't the know. marathon. Yeah, this, marathon, this fall right? Now, so yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So you, so just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. So you're building strong, right? Yep. So why are we trying to 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 mask quote unquote air quotes if if you're listening? Why is it about safety instead of about strength? Well, I. I wouldn't dispute any of that. I, again, at the end of the day, right now with where we're at as a state, those those decisions, and actually the other forty nine states, you know, that's that's one of the things about our system right now. I don't I don't know that any of the states have had that type of response. I think that's a good good discussion to have right now. Like I mentioned earlier, we're not even having the discussions yeah. or the hearings to impact this or to be able to propose those types of ideas. So yeah. um, I think that that. That would be another great question. But even as a society, I think if you really circle around to it, uh, and I've been starting to study this a little personal bit. Personal responsibility. Sa- the, the personal responsibility, yeah. the, the safetyism culture. Um, let's just bring up my daughter as an example. I raised my kids. Hopefully, I tried to, I, I mean, to make them strong. Right. And my daughter died in a car crash. Right. 
she was wearing her seatbelt, you know, it was taught all the right things, but ultimately she made a decision mm -hmm. that wasn't safe. Right. And she paid the ultimate price for that, mm -hmm. which is extremely unfortunate mm -hmm. and heart wrenching to say the least. And, you know, I'm going to have to stop so I don't start crying, but right. I did what I could to make them strong. Mm -hmm. And each one of my kids would say, dad, you have been the biggest asshole that we have ever known. But they hopefully, as adults, yeah. will now say thank you, yeah. because that's we, we they're strong, right? Right. My other daughter lives in South Carolina on her own. She's strong. I know she can do that. I. It, what if I would have raised them to be safe? Hmm. Yeah. And they went through the things they did. The the three the three others, my three other kids, to uh, of their sister's death. What if What if I didn't raise them to be strong? Why are we looking at things in, 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 I know I'm digressing big time here, <laughs> but why are we not looking at things to build strong people? Why are we trying to build safe people? Well, it, it gets to a political philosophy, of course, and that, yeah. that is there are folks that believe the government will take care of them. And How did we get that? <laughs> I... I think the government started taking care of people in in a lot of ways, and and you know it's uh, it it's a little bit like the frog in the boiling water, yeah, right? You, yeah. you put a frog in boiling water, it's going to leap out as quickly as it possibly can. But if you turn up the heat slowly over time, and so whether it's farm programs or farm subsidies or something that mm. our farmers have become dependent on, uh, that means government plays a bigger role in yeah. deciding what you're going to grow and how you're going to grow it. And sure. some of those things have had positive outcomes. And, uh, you know, we certainly know that um, farmers have had, had struggles. And, and as, a, as a nation, we value uh, a lot of our commodity growth, whether it's sugar. I mean, we subsidize our <laughs> sugar yeah. industry. You, you want to look at an interesting story. Look at how the United States creates a sugar product in the United States when we could buy sugar much less expensively than how much money we subsidize the sugar industry. But it's a decision because, especially in, in this COVID environment that we're in, we don't want to have a shortage of sugar. Right. And we know that having shipping issues or anything else, uh, and this is you know, it's really an impact of World War II still, of why we do so heavily subsidize some of our commodities yeah, so that absolutely. we're not dependent on other countries um, when it comes to these these resources. So, um, you know, we, we, I think as a, as a country we, and as a citizenry, we, we really do believe that the government will take care of us. Um, and that personal responsibility does get lost a little bit in, in, that, in that way. Um, there are individuals I know who they've paid off their college loans and they hear about loan forgiveness yeah, programs yeah, or yeah. they hear about presidential candidates making uh, promises to give free college away. Right. And, you know, I just don't know that people truly appreciate things when they're free. Uh, or they, they, they take it for granted and they, they end up kind of, well, you know, if, if I'm the one with skin in the game, yep. if I've made that investment, I'm going to show up to class on time. Yep. If, if these classes were free and someone else is paying for them, I mean, I'll sign up. Someone, <laughs> someone, I heard a story, someone had put it to this, this way to college students. Um, in fact, I, I believe they even had classes that, that were this kind of s stemmed from. And what they did was is that uh, it was, okay, if it's okay to give money to you and you're not working for it, we're going to give your grades right. away. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yeah. yeah. You know, and that makes a lot of sense to a college student. Right. right? You right. know, the college students uh, working really hard and getting A's and the, the C students are going right. to get benefits. So then their grades level off at, you know, a B minus or whatever. Yeah. And I actually think they did do that as an experiment in a class. Right. In, in to catastrophic did, to, consequences exactly. is usually what the, the discussion is. And, yes. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we know that. And, and um, you know, again, we see that in, in statistics just on the high rate of diabetes in our country. Obesity is, of course, a, a major yeah. player in that. And, and uh, you know, the, the consequences are our health care costs go up, and, and yet we're not paying for the health care if it's free health care. 
Um, so, you know, in a lot of circumstances, either people are insured or they're on public programs and not paying for that. We have some people, though, who are in the private system that don't have insurance or aren't on a public program, and then they have to pay for those things. They're more motivated than to obviously take care of their health. And, of course, bad things can happen to people who have made the best preparations right. and done the, the best thing to prepare their bodies. And, and uh, so... You know, it's it's a it's a sticky issue, and uh, um, but it affects uh, the local uh, a lot more. So, so many people think that it, well, that's out there, right? And you know, it's not a problem for me, and it's not going to be a problem for Rochester and some of those things. That's not even in the neighborhood of true, right? You know, those those types of things and this kind of way of thinking, in my opinion, has to it 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 does affect the local, and it has to start at local to affect the the mass too you have to say you know we're not gonna we're not gonna take it anymore is that a song or something like that we're gonna take this but and and start that you know from there um what can what can you let's uh, we've been talking for a while as usual we have (laughs) it's always nice (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you as well. I always enjoy it. But um, we should probably wrap up. So let's, uh, and we should, maybe we better do this again sometime. Yeah, but, yeah, sure. Um, I, th- I already think we're going to have to cut this into two parts. Let's Sweet. do it. All right. And um, But why don't you wrap up with just what makes you you? Why should people look at you um, instead of your opponent? And I don't want you to, and I know you're not going to, but I want to say this publicly. I don't want you to to slam your opponent. I want you to lift yourself sure. up. Sure. Um, and I know you well enough that you weren't going to do that anyway. Right. But I just want to publicly say <laughs> yeah. not to do that because sure. that's what happens all the time. Yeah, and I, I guess I've, I'm running this race no different than I've run my previous three races and and that's where i would start i had the opportunity in 2013 to explore running for this office long before the election of 2014 because the guy who was sitting in the seat the republican candidate uh, i kind of was tipped off that he was going to run for congress Mm. and so in july of 2013 i started or june of 2013 i started exploring this opportunity and by july my family and i made the decision to move forward but, but not until we'd talked to a lot of people within the community already in June of, of uh, 2013. And I, I think that that's imp- it's, uh, it's really the main theme that we started with today is just being able to talk to people. Mm-hmm. And in 2014, 15, 16, um, 17, 18, 19, I've gone to those township meetings every year. And it's the township meetings are 14, five city council meetings, and now I'm adding the county commissioner's meeting. That's 20 meetings every year outside of what I do in the actual legislature. Yeah. So it may not sound like a lot until you start adding them all up. And then, of course, I have to do forums and, and just meetings with constituents in general on specific issues when they call me in uh, people in the disability community are constantly educating me here locally on some of their needs and shortcomings right now that that we're dealing with mm. as a state um and and i i guess for me that's the most important thing is just being able to be the ear first and and listening to people listening to the needs within the community understanding those getting that perspective and then getting to St. Paul, the work is almost done because mm-hmm. now now the ideas are in front of us. And whether I'm bringing ideas forward from those communications or other members are bringing those forwards and we, we continue the discussions on those topics and issues, that's, that's where the really the rubber hits the road everyone sees that final red and green vote but it's really the work is done so much before that Mm -hmm. um you know i've been out door knocking i've been making phone calls i've been uh out in the community as much as physically possible this year we didn't have our parades that we normally have we certainly miss some of the folks that we see year after year season after season at at our uh, summer festivals and events in in 
Olmstead County. Uh, we didn't have our county fair this year. That was heartbreaking, but, but I'm still accessible. Um, I'm a phone call away 90% of the time. You can Google Nels Pearson and you'll find my cell phone number actually because I'm a realtor. That's my full-time job. I'm sure. with Edina Realty in Rochester. How come you make me message you all the time and I, not call you? I, I you, I'm you totally go kidding. ahead and call I'm me anytime. Just, I'm totally kidding. Um, but but uh, my email address I also try to make as easy to remember, mainly for myself. But nels.com is my website, so my email is nels at nels.com. And, uh, and that's, like I say, I put that invitation out there to anyone. If they have a topic or an issue, I'll come with an open mind and, and certainly will we'll give you the time to, to listen to those, those issues and, and really be, resp- be the responsive state representative on a level that I, I've watched so many of my township officers bring to their, their work as well, where, again, I, I live with you. Um, I live in your community, and and I certainly understand the issues. Uh, having grown up on a dairy farm in a town called Butterfield, and having family that's still involved in in agricultural enterprises and operations, I I know the issues of the folks out in my townships. But I've lived in Rochester long enough now to know um, I moved in this area in 95. And I know the issues that Rochester is facing as well. And we, we've certainly seen uh, the impacts of what's been going on in our, in our COVID world and how that's impacted Mayo Clinic in a positive way also. Um, you know, I guess yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll maybe segue into a, yeah. an ending on a positive note. I, I really do see... All of the enterprises that are going to be successful moving forward, um, I really see them reinventing how we provide services to people or how people are able to be productive. And we heard the announcements uh, specifically from Mayo Clinic, of course, that people who have been allowed to work from home, by and large, are going to continue Mm -hmm. working from home. That's life-changing. it lowers the value of commercial real estate in downtown Rochester. So there's an opportunity. Give me a call. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we do have these dynamics where hopefully that creates more productivity, which ultimately, again, if they're more productive, mm-hmm. that should drive down some costs um, and, and more efficient. I mean, those are those are all good things. Uh, and, and again, even opening up commercial real estate in downtown Rochester, that's opportunity for our community to grow in a new way uh, that we never would have anticipated or expected without this having happened. Now, I want to make sure we're also reforming state government on that level as well. How can we deliver efficiency at that level for our state government, our, both our employees and the consumers of of state government services, um, you know, even just revolutionizing how we practice medicine. Telemedicine has been something we've been discussing and people have been resistant to for a long time. Well, now we're doing some more exemptions so that more telemedicine can be used. When a doctor can sit down with 20 patients in an hour instead of five patients in an hour, that just goes towards lowering the cost of health care. And we need to focus on those types of learning opportunities that we, I think, are experiencing right now. And I, I hope as a society, as a culture, we can grow and build and learn from these things and, and, and produce more and hopefully lower our costs or our budget deficit isn't quite as, as uh, difficult to deal with in the next biennium. But uh, that's me in a nutshell, and, and again, I always appreciate coming over and, and having a chat, and and if you want to have a chat, just give me a call or send me an email, and we'll get together. Awesome. See you next time. You bet. Thank you, Matt. <laughs>